Hello, welcome to an adventure. Today we are exploring seed catalogs from the Rare Books collection uh, from the time period of the late 19th and early 20th centuries on episode number 17 of Archival Adventures. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Uh, before we begin, I just have a couple of an announcements to get to. Um, I want to acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. I want to pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Sorry, getting a notification here. Let me just finish my um, announcement. Hi, Hannah. Um, Further, I, I do want to also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land. Um, I want to acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So with that, we will begin today's adventure. Let me um, mute the speakers on this computer, because it was just giving me a... Uh, a little bit of sound there and I got a note that I am a bit dark and um, so I need to adjust the lighting in here uh, which means I need to step away for just one second and I will be right back in front of the camera. So hopefully that will be better. <laughs> I think we just had the soft lights um, and we needed some of the overheads as well. So um, yeah, welcome, welcome everybody. <laughs> I see the note, Hannah, thank you. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, I just, I walked in, the lights were as they were, and I didn't touch them. Um, but now I know I need some overhead in the mix uh, to make it work. <laughs> um, yeah, how is everybody today? Hopefully you've had a good Wednesday. Um, we're getting toward the end of May. I think calendar-wise, is there one more Wednesday after this one? I'm just going to check because that might affect, yes. So next, next Wednesday will be the last Wednesday in May. And as, uh, as you may recall, if you've been here for multiple Wednesdays, yes, Hannah. <laughs> yes, indeed. This is a Keyleth pin um, to fit with the theme. Uh, May, we've been focused on trying to look at gardening type stuff, um, plant life, etc. Um, so last week we had the watercolors of fungi. Of course, the first week in May we actually had a holdover from April when I was doing LGBT content because the Michael Collins papers got mixed in uh, on the last Wednesday of April, but that's okay. May we've been focusing on um, gardening and plant life and things like that. So last week we had the watercolors of fungi. This week we're looking at seed catalogs. Next week we may be looking at the Master Gardener program here at Virginia Tech, but also when I was pulling the seed catalogs, I saw the most amazing book that I had not seen in our collection before. Um, it's actually a set of books that have samples of trees in them. And I may just want to do, the, like, 
I may want to start the stream looking at that. I don't know if it would take the whole stream because there's not a lot of content. It's just little panels of wood from trees. Um, and there's not like a ton of description with it or anything like that. But um, I may start with that and have the Master Gardener stuff along uh, to take a look at if that doesn't end up filling up enough time. But um, the, the tree book, the wood book, I think is what we're going to do next week uh, because I'd never seen it before and it was really cool. And so um, I think I think that I'm going to share that and we'll do the Master Gardener stuff another time, maybe when we're doing like Virginia Tech focus things or maybe next year if we do another plant focused month. I don't know. We'll find out. Um, but yeah, today is seed seed stuff. Also, I haven't decided what we're doing for June. I need to think about that. I'll have more on that for you next week. Um, so in the past, I've done uh, exhibits and pulled materials for actually in support of the Virginia Tech Master Gardener program. And with that, I pulled a bunch of these seed catalogs um, I don't know a ton about them, personally. Uh, Kira may be on later, and she may know a bit more. Um, but we have seed catalogs going back to the late 1800s um, and on up through, like, the 50s. Um, so I thought it would be fun to look at them, kind of see what seeds were available, how they described the different plants. Uh, with the weather being spring-like and it kind of being planting season, I kind of thought that that was a good direction to go in. Um, so I pulled a bunch of these and we'll take a look at them today. Um, and I just got a raid. <laughs> Welcome in 16-Bit Eric and the Whimsies. Um, <laughs> hi, Rafe Faye. Hi, Adventures of Tony. Let me do a shout out, because uh, I always forget to. Uh, if you happen to be here and you don't already follow 16-Bit Eric, he is well worth a follow. He is absolutely one of the best people that I have ever encountered. Um, three days a week on his channel, he does some chatting or game playing. He knows tons about tabletop role playing games. Um, and is also the host of, or the, the GM for the Streampunks RPG Group's current uh, campaign of Star Trek Adventures on Monday evenings at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Time on the Q Times channel, um, as well as a player in the Gary Con Live Gax Pack TTRPG on Saturday evenings. So definitely, if you're not already a follower, go ahead and uh, give a uh, give a Give a follow over to 16-Bit um, Eric. I don't know if we have a follow command or a shout out command in in the studio's uh, channel, but I'll try. Uh, there it is. So 16-Bit um, Eric just raided the Rogan 27 channel, which is why I was just talking about him. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, yes, welcome in, Raiders. Uh, thank you for joining. Today is Wednesday, which is when I do Archival Adventures. I was just getting through the introduction. Um, today on Archival Adventures, we're continuing our May uh, focus on plant life and gardening. Last week, it was watercolors of fungi. This week, we're looking at seed catalogs from the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and next week, We'll either be looking at the Virginia Tech uh, Cooperative Extension Master Gardener Program or a book of samples of trees that I ran across today that I think is really cool and we'll probably be looking at. Um, so yes, welcome uh, Eric, Ray Fay, um, Philby63, uh, Lord Portico. Lord Portico, thank you so much for the resubscription five months. 
Uh, <laughs> and you deserve to be very many places. Um, Caden 303, welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna switch this over so that you can all see the document. Uh, the seed catalog, I have the first one here pulled up. Um, many, many messages. So the first one that I have, uh, I, these are actually currently in um, Library of Congress order, so the, the, the call number order. Uh, so we'll be encountering them however they got categorized uh, that way. But uh, from what I can tell, that's mostly by manufacturer. So this is Hoffman's. Um, but yeah, so first one that we have here is Hoffman's Farm Seeds from 1926. Um, they all have beautiful like illustrations on the front. Uh, and here, I guess, I I'm not 100% sure what kind of flowers those are. Um, if anybody does know, feel free to pop that into the chat uh, because Either that or we'll find out as we look. Um, so here we actually get, whoo. So this was 1926. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so that you can read along with me as we look at this. Um, the inside cover they give inside views of Hoffman's Seed Warehouse, Landisville, Pennsylvania, Lancaster County. Uh, and so they just have some pictures of what the inside of their seed warehouse is. Uh, so if you order from them, this is where your seeds would be coming from. The first two pictures show sections of the order filling department. Note the piles of even sized bags all ready for tagging and quick shipment. Observe the overhead seed corn racks. Notice how perfectly the air may circulate around each ear, thus ensuring the best cured seed possible. So the, the evenly sized bags would be here. Um, these would be the seed corn racks up here. And then we get a view of the various seed cleaning machines. Much of the success of Hoffman's seed business is due to the quality of cleaning these machines turn out. They help to explain why Hoffman's seeds pay. And of course, these are marketing, uh, these are marketing documents. So that's why I kind of am reading them in a marketing tone. Um, here is shown a section of the main office where your mail and seed orders are handled. Much modern machinery necessary for quick handling of the heavy ma mails received is here installed. Visitors welcome any business day. They will see more than these few pictures can show. <laughs> so 1926, um, not a whole lot of color, which is not surprising. Color printing, even today, costs a lot of money. Um, but this is a farm seed catalog, so high quality seed for, your, for every farm crop. Your farm deserves good seeds, and this book points you toward them. This is not a list of new, untried things, fancy priced novelties, etc. Nor is it full of special bargain offers, because such things don't go along with a sound, healthy farm seed business. But you will find this book to contain the plain truth on reliable kinds of seeds for the standard farm crops, and maybe some pointers on other crops you are less familiar with. You should be among the thousands who each year depend on Hoffman's catalog for their seed supplies. If you pay them, or they would, uh, it, it must pay them or they would not do it. 
and just so surely will it pay you. To you, if already a Hoffman customer, do we extend a warm thanks for your support, because it is only those like yourself that have made this seed service possible. We're counting on you as a 1926 buyer. You will find us trying to please you as we trade together in good seeds. A. H. Hoffman Incorporated. They have a note here important about seed prices. Thirteen years ago, our firm started a plan that has since been adopted by most other houses. It was thought that farmers had the right to know before they ordered just what their seed would finally stand them, sacked and delivered to their station. Hence our, office, er, hence our offers about free bags and prepaid freight charges. This plan has proven so much to customers' advantage that it has been maintained without charge ever since the day it was first announced. Interesting. So basically what they're saying is they're not going to charge you for the bags and they're not going to charge you for the delivery. They're just going to charge you for the seeds. And that was new and highly popular. And then they talk a little bit about, let's see, in the beginning here we've got the clovers. Sweet clover. I guess that kind of looks like what's on the front. I don't know if it is, though. Sweet clover. With the outlook for high prices on most other legume seeds, sweet clover will likely be used more than ever this year. The following lines cover the uses of sweet clover. Yet where readers wish more complete information, they might ask for the free bulletins on this subject issued by the U.S. Department of Agriculture at Washington, or for recent free bulletins issued by the Kansas and Nebraska departments. They are very complete. I'm not going to read all of it. I just thought we'd take a look. Uh, this one is less illustrated and a lot more text heavy than some of the others in the collection. Um, 10 pointers on alfalfa. Ooh, facts about alfalfa from 1926. I used to feed alfalfa to my um, pet gerbil when I was a kid. Hamster, not gerbil, but that's okay. Uh, I still fed alfalfa. There is no state in the Union in which alfalfa cannot be successfully grown. Alfalfa produces from three to seven tons hay to the acre. It will grow three to five crops a year. It has as much protein as wheat bran. It does not exhaust the soil. It enriches the soil. 360 stalks have been grown from one seed. Three pounds... Oh. Ugh. I'm skipping lines. Alfalfa in money value is worth 45% more than other clovers and 60% more than Timothy. One acre will pasture 20 pigs for six months. Three pounds a day makes full feed for fattening lambs. Four to five pounds for aged sheep. 35 pounds for steers. Lambs wintered on alfalfa will produce one to two pounds more wool than when on the ranch. Fed to dairy cows, alfalfa maintains the flow of milk equal to June grass. It can be chopped fine with cornmeal. Such a mixture is worth more a pound than the original cornmeal. Its long branching roots penetrate far down, push the crowd to the earth, push and crowd to the earth this way and that, and thus constitute a gigantic subsoiler. These become an immense mag. These become an immense magazine of fertility. As soon as cut, they begin to decay and liberate the vast reservoir of fertilizing matter below the plow to be drawn up by other crops for years to come. 
<laughs> it's very salesman-y how they write about them. I wonder how much of it is accurate and how much of it is just to sell the seed. Here we have an insert in the um, catalog. This is the actual price list. So we were just looking at alfalfa, and so alfalfa seed, ooh, wow. <laughs> the text is very small. Give me one second. I'll put it back in front of you. I just need to be able to read this if I'm going to read it to you. I oh, okay. There's an abbreviation that I was unfamiliar with. But um, so the price is per BU 60 pounds, um, which means per bushel. Uh, so per 60 pound bushel, alfalfa seed is 1375 for Kansas alfalfa, 1425 for Northwest alfalfa. $25 for Grimm alfalfa, and $17 for Canada variegated alfalfa. Interesting. So that's a lot of seed, honestly, 60 pounds of alfalfa seed. That's going to be quite a lot. Well, I have a lot more catalogs. Let's look at one that's got more pictures. <laughs> I like to, to read the, um, the marketing, uh, just because I enjoy reading marketing text. Um, I think it's fun to read. But at the same time, I need good visuals, because this is a stream. All right, so this one is BK Bliss and Sons Illustrated Handbook for the Farm and Garden and Catalog of Garden, Field, and Flower Seeds from 1880. So we have BK Bliss and Sons Illustrated Handbook for the Farm and Garden and Catalog of Garden, Field, and Flower Seeds, 34 Barclay Street, New York. Uh, this one is a bit delicate, so I am going to use the foam so that I don't stress the what remains of the uh, spine. So if you're not familiar, I have foam a foam wedge. I have two foam wedges, um, and I'm going to use that to support the book so that I will not stress the spine as we're turning pages in it. Novelties and seeds, sorry, novelties and other seeds of special merit or of recent introduction, many of which are now offered for the first time in this country. Calendula aficionalis. Uh, that's the illustration there. I don't know what that is. Um, it's a flower, clearly, but. Um, Agaratum Laskauxi, 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 Whoo, that's hard to say. A lovely rose-colored variety of this beautiful bedding plant, fine also for pot culture. New climbing asparagus, that's much easier to say. One of the finest of all the hardy climbers and a very desirable trellis plant. It has the beautiful feathery foliage of the ordinary asparagus. 
in the form of a graceful running vine, admirable, admirably adapted for decorative purposes, for which florists will find it invaluable. It is covered in the fall with bright red berries, which form a beautiful contrast to the deep green foliage. The plant dies down to the ground like the ordinary asparagus in the fall and makes a rapid growth in spring. So everything in this pink section are new items that have not previously been available in the United States as of 1880. Bayview Melon, the largest, most prolific, best flavored, and finest cantaloupe in cultivation. With ordinary cultivation, it will grow from 10 to 15 pounds in weight, while with extra cultivation, it will weigh 17 to 20 pounds, with a length of from 16 to 18 inches. In quality and flavor, the Bayview excels all other varieties of cantaloupes. It is peculiarly luscious and sweet. It will yield from 3,000 to 4,000 melons, or from 15 to 20 tons or more to the acre. It is the most hardy, hardy melon known. As a market melon, whenever introduced, it sells at extra prices on account of its beauty, size, and fine quality. It is only about five days later than the small early Jenny Lind. It can be picked White green will ripen up finely and carry safely for a long distance. Per packet, 15 cents. Ounce, 40 cents. Pound, $4. There's a small insert here about new German pansies. We take much pleasure in offering to lovers of this favorite flower an entirely new strain, which is a wonderful improvement over any before uh, offered in this country. The group on the opposite page is no fancy sketch, but true to the nature and size in colors. I don't believe we have the opposite page. That page appears to be missing from the book. Uh, so far as it is possible to reproduce them, although the tints are far richer and more delicate in nature than in the plate. The flowers from which these were painted were grown in the vicinity of New York the past season. Interesting. I wish we had the picture, but that page appears to not be in the book anymore. I do not know when it was removed. Also, I have no idea where we actually got this book from, um, whether it was sent to us new or whether it came from somebody else's collection. Um, it, it's hard to know with a lot of the stuff in the Rare Books collection exactly how it made its way to us. Uh, so I have no way of knowing whether that page was there when we received it and has been subsequently removed or whether that page was missing when we got the book. This appears to be a varieties of cabbage. Um, Marblehead Mammoth on the upper left, Stonemason, Improved American Savoy, Premium Flat Dutch, Half Early Paris Cauliflower, and Early Wyman. I'm uncertain why the cauliflower is included there with all of the cabbages. To my knowledge, cauliflower is not a type of cabbage, but uh, interesting. Oh, I've got a message. Oh, I don't. It was just blinking at me from a long time ago. Let's see what else we have. There are some that have many more images. Also, if anybody watching has questions about stuff, I'm happy to try and answer, uh, whether it be about the materials we are looking at or about archival practice in general. Um, I'm open to answering questions. Hey, 
Hi, Kira. Calendula is one of the two birth flowers of October. I did not know that. Really? Uh, Karen W., thank you. I did not know that cauliflower and cabbage are the same species. I, um, I think these catalogs are neat, but this is definitely not my area of expertise. So, <laughs> um, here we have Joseph Breck and Sons. Uh, still got kind of a deteriorating spine, so we'll stick with the foam. Joseph Breck and Sons Garden Field and Flower Seeds, established 1822. Um, they've got some illustrations of plant life, a woman in her garden wearing um, a very fashionable 1820s hat and uh, outfit there. But then there's this little cherub figure here, the, the naked child. Um, the font choice, I don't really quite understand. In modern context, this font choice would be um, something we would expect on a Chinese restaurant or a stereotypical depictions of East Asian cultures. Um, so I'm not sure why it is in use here uh, on this seed catalog from 1822. You were just posting cabbage, brussels, mustard greens, and more in that family. Cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, kale, brussels sprouts, and a bunch of others. I did not know that. That is really interesting. Oh, the other birth flower for October is Cosmos, which I did not, I was not familiar with before Animal Crossing New Horizons came out last year. Um, that game introduced me to Cosmos. Annual descriptive catalog. What I find really interesting about selective breeding is um, the fact that so much of our food is not in its natural state. Bananas used to have giant seeds in them, um, and they were bred selectively to reduce the size, size of the seeds. Or um, I mean, uh, honestly, wheat has changed quite a significant amount from its wild progenitor state through cultivation. We've made it more palatable and more digestible for us. Um, Brussels sprouts over like the last couple of decades have become less bitter. Uh, there are an, a, a number of examples of just through cultivation and selective breeding, we've created a lot of the foods that we think of as natural foods, um, but we've, we've selected for certain aspects and um, made them more what we desire as a species. And I, I suppose that would be true of these, um, the flowers here too. This is a catalog right now of flower seeds. I'm not sure what I want to highlight in this catalog. I just, ooh, here we go. 25 varieties of choice selected annual flower seeds for $1. Lovely little picture here. There's not, it, honestly, if I was a gardener, just a personal gardener and not shopping for like massive quantities, this, this catalog would be, would overwhelm me. Novelties and specialties of flower, in flower seeds for 1883. Let's see. 
Aquilegia chrysantha, golden spurred columbine, a strong growing beautiful variety forming bushy plants three feet high, producing freely all summer an abundance of golden yellow flowers. Delphinium hyacinthiforum giganteum, giant hyacinth flowered larkspur, red dish gray, a distinct race of larkspur attaining a height of three and a half to four feet. A peculiar and distinguishing feature is that from the main stem are emitted at a height of two feet, five to eight radiate flower stalks of about eight inches in length the flowers of which in form and doubleness exactly resemble those of the dwarf hyacinth flowered larkspur. That is a very particular description. It doesn't seem to be like marketing speak. These are this this catalog has a much more matter of fact kind of scientific description feel to how it's talking about the items. Um I don't know if that has to do with the time period, but I don't think it does. I think it's just a difference in approach. Um, this one is from 1883 and is called a descriptive catalog of seed, etc. Henderson's Snowball Cauliflower. One of the very earliest and most reliable sorts, it is very dwarf and being a, of compact form, heads large. What? This sentence is a little difficult because it reads weird. It is very dwarf and being of compact form, heads large and of superior quality. For forcing under glass during the winter and spring, this variety is well adapted. It may be added that this variety does equally as well for late sowing. Price per packet, 25 cents per ounce, $4. Hmm. <laughs> See what the next one looks like. I'm rolling over the headphone cord. One second. There we go. This one is very colorful on the front. 1952. That that's probably why it's so much more colorful. Condon Brothers Seedsman, 1952 annual catalog, Rock River Valley Seed Farm, Rockford, Illinois. Condon's new hybrid vegetables. New hybrid Io Chief sweet corn. Condon's giant hybrid tomato. Condon's new hybrid cucumber. Sweet corn, Io Chief Hybrid, Iowa College, latest in introduction, yellow hybrid, tops the list to eat fresh off the cob to can or for freezing. 83 days, ears 7 to 8 inches long, 16 row, 2 ounces packet, 2 ounce packet, 25 cents, half pound, 50 cents, pound, 90 cents, 2 pounds, $1.70, postage paid. Um, it's interesting to me uh, how, how, mu how much we've swung in a little over, what, I guess around 70 years or so, we've swung from loudly proclaiming, claiming Look at these, look at these wonderful new vegetables developed by science to uh, people really not wanting 
GMOs, genetically modified organisms, but hybridization is a form of genetic modification. Um, so it, it's interesting to me, like they were advertising how these had been newly, scient newly scientifically developed through hybridization, and that was a selling point for them in 1952, but today any hint of genetic modification is considered bad uh, when it comes to the fruits and vegetables that we eat. I don't really have an opinion to share on it. I just think it's interesting that that, that is kind of the shift in narrative that's happened in 70 years. Three new beautiful annual flowers for 1952. Special offer number 14. One packet each. One dollar postpaid. We have petunias and tetra snapdragons and tithonia. Uh, down in the lower corner here is the tithonia. Tithonia, torch. All-America winner for 1951, most publicized flower novelty in years. As easy to grow as zinnias, thrives in hot weather, produces cut flowers that bloom from August until frost. Pack it for 45 cents, postpaid. Sorry, my pocket kept buzzing and I just had to make sure there was no sort of like emergency or anything. Um. Plant the new streamliner, giant ever-bearing strawberry, and have all the luscious big red berries you want both spring and fall. Outbears any other ever-bearing strawberry equal to many spring-bearing varieties. One planter, <coughs> pardon me. One planter reported returns of over twenty-five thousand dollars from one acre the past season. Color rich red, clear through, firm, of high texture, sweet and delicious. It will bear this summer, starting sixty to ninety days after planting, and will continue to bear right up until heavy frost. Next year, you will have spring, summer, and fall fruit. Next year, oh, whoops, <laughs> I already read that sentence. It really has everything. Fine flavor, large size, good color, heavy bearing, and is, and is self-pollinizing. Supply is limited and demand will be heavy, so order early, please. 25 plants for $2.50, 50 for $4.50, 100 for $7.50, 250 for $12.50, 500 for $20, 1,000 for $35, 2,000 and over for $32.50 per prepaid. Wow. New thornless boysenberry, new cultivated blueberry. Giant dahlias. There's a lot of red in this catalog. Icebox watermelon. New Canadian red rhubarb. Oh, you can't see those. They're down at the bottom of the page. I feel like they paid the printer s like mostly for red and green as the colors. Because even here on this, this page is basically black and white, but they still have red ink. Oh. 
things did weird things on my computer screen and it took me a second. Let's see. Big bargain vegetable collection. Big flower seed bargain collection. Lima beans, steam cheese, some, some more color pages later on. Condoms Asters, giant double flowering mixed colors. Here is a wilt resistant strain of giant double branching aster carefully blended so as to give your garden a rainbow of color from early summer until fall. Plant is sturdy, two to three feet tall, blooms average four inches and better across. Branching freely, producing abundance of blooms on stalks 18 to 24 inches long, making them excellent for cutting or bouquets. A packet for 15 cents and eight, one eighth ounce for 50 cents, quarter ounce for 75 cents, half ounce for $1.25, and a full ounce for $2.25. But again, like, the only colors in this book are red and green. They have red in different shades, giving you pinks, but otherwise it's, it's only printed in red and green, which I did not notice at first, but by this point in the book, definitely do notice. see what the next catalog has to offer. Ah, this is the one that I used for the, um, for the tweet about today's show. Digs and Beetles Seeds, 1930 got some wonderful art. These are drawn. They're not pictures. Uh, Marglobe tomato, golden bantam corn, and Texas Laxton peas, and a Detroit dark red beet. Digs and Beetles Incorporated, general store and office, 1428 East Main Street, branch store and warehouses, 1711 to 9 East Franklin Street, branch store uptown, 603 to 5 East Marshall Street, Richmond, Virginia. So let's see what Digs and Beetles had to offer. The very first item in here, the very first thing in their book from 1930 was Digs and Beetles Velvet Green Lawn Grass. Digs and Beetles Velvet Green Lawn Grass is composed entirely of the very highest grade and most suitable grasses for making a beautiful lawn as respects color, texture, and permanency. We have made a careful study of the difficulties met with in, met with in making a pretty and permanent lawn, and after many years of experiment, we have made this per perfectly balanced mixture of American and European grasses which do best in our climate. Only the finest grades are used in this mixture, both as to purity and germination. This is far better than Kentucky bluegrass, as it produces a beautiful green velvety award, uh, uh, sorry, as it produces a beautiful green velvety sward in six to eight weeks from time of sowing and lasts for many years without reseeding. It is better adapted to the diff different soils and stands the heat and drought of summer as well as severe cold better than many of the mixtures so commonly offered. 
that we have been successful in securing the most desirable combination is shown in the character of the beautiful lawns surrounding the handsome homes of many of our customers, our city parks, cemeteries, and other public grounds in and around Richmond, as well as many large country estates who use this mixture in large quantities. Every year adds to its popularity and increasing sales. It should be kept in mind when comparing prices that this grass is composed of the choicest, cleanest, and heaviest seeds. It produces a beautiful and enduring tur turf without the aid of cheap, quick-growing seeds that are only of temporary value. And we feel safe in saying that, there, that a better lawn grass cannot be secured in any way, or at any price. Whew. Per pound, 50 cents. Two pounds, 90 cents. Five pounds, two dollars, postpaid. Not postpaid per pound, 40 cents, 2 pounds, 75 cents, 5 pounds, $1.75, 10 pounds, 3.40, etc. So postpaid is you pay after you get it, and not postpaid would be paying up front. Uh, so they're offering a cheaper price if you pay up front. Oh, the order form here, um, they have the price sheet, price list. Um, nope, Windows, I am not restarting. Thank you. Uh, and it's actually attached to the order form here. Um, there's like a little square up here in the corner where it's been pasted in. That's pretty cool. And it, it still adheres there very strongly after all of this time. Gardener's Guide and Sewing Table. Oh, this is pretty neat. We've seen some interesting tables like this in the past. Uh, I believe it was in a diary that we saw um, some similar things. This table has been carefully prepared and answers hundreds of questions gardeners and farmers want to know. Time of planting is for latitude of Richmond. Therefore, allowances should accordingly be made for more northern or southern climates. For fuller instructions, see cultural directions under the heading of each kind of vegetable. So this says that for alfalfa, you should plant or you should sow or plant in March, April, and August through to October 15th. Quantity for 100 feet, it just says broadcast. I'm not sure what that means. Quantity for an acre, 25 to 30 pounds. Distance between rows, broadcast. I'm guessing, so broadcast to my knowledge would be you take a bunch of it, like if you're doing it manually, you would take a handful of seeds and just kind of toss them around. Um, that to me seems like what broadcast would be. Depth is three quarters of an inch. Maturity of crop May of the next year. Interesting. So it gives all sorts of little details about the different plants that way. So I find it very interesting, the different kinds of corn. Here we have garden corn and sweet or sugar corn um, separated out. We have culture, plant three or four grains, 
or it's telling you what to do with culture corn. Adam's Extra Early. This well-known variety is the earliest and hardiest white garden corn. Because of this, it is largely grown by market gardeners in the south for the earliest crop. The ears are short and thick, and while rather small, they are usually ready about seven weeks after planting. It can be planted close as the stalks grow only about four feet high. This variety should be grown on good land, well fertilized. And then there's, so that was Adam's extra early. Then there's Adam's early. Then there's improved Adam's early. And then there's one called Trucker's Favorite. A splendid second early hardy whitey, woo. A splendid second early hardy white corn coming in about a week later than the improved ear of beautiful market and table appearance. Oh, sorry. I skipped a line there. Amazingly, it, it read okay. Uh, coming in about a week later than the improved Adams early, it has deep white soft grains, tender and sweet, and makes a good-sized roasting ear of beautiful market and table appearance. Not only is this one of the best corns for second early use, but it is also a good variety to plant late to mature corn quickly for stock feeding or for marketing meal. It may be planted as late as July 15th and will then make good corn before frost. But the ones that we're more likely to actually have encountered on our table are things like the golden bantam. This is a distinct variety and is really a superb early sweet corn. It has golden yellow grains, deliciously sweet and tender, exceptionally rich and pleasing with a flavor all its own. It is hardy and can be planted earlier than most sweet corns. The ears are eight rowed, six to seven inches long, generally two to the stalk. We consider this the best early sweet corn for the family garden. And then there's Country Gentleman, a favorite variety for mid-season and late crop, both for table use and canning purposes. Has small white cob thickly covered with irregular rows of very long, slender white grains of excellent quality. The ears are eight to nine inches long and er, with two or more to the stalk, which grows six to seven feet high considered by many the best of the light later varieties, keeps tender and fit for use through a long season. We've got cantaloupe and muskmelon. So this catalog here is much more um, aimed at like the small and family farmer. So it still gives pricing that would apply for people buying for farms. Um, but I feel like this is much more geared toward a like a single family home type of garden. Um, the descriptions they're giving, the way that they're giving images of a lot of things. Um, they offer smaller quantities of things. I feel like this is more geared toward a gardener or at least acknowledging that part of their business includes the gardener and not just the farmer. Ooh, beekeeping supplies. Lewis B. Ware. Put your bees in up-to-date, finely made hives and they will pay you big profits. 10-frame hive with metal roof cover, each 31 pounds, $3.55. Crate of five for 145 pounds and six, $6 and, sorry, $16 and 10 cents. 10-frame uh, honeycomb supers for scallop sections. 10 frame full depth supers or bodies, 10 frame half depth supers with shallow frames. A sheet, uh, so the 10 frame full depth supers or bodies 
are a sheet of bee comb foundation. Must, oh, nope. Let me try that again and actually read the description and put it on screen where you all can see it because I've not been good at that today. You know, I wonder if I do this. Nope, <laughs> now I've got things upside down. <laughs> it's this way. Does this make it any easier for you all to see? <laughs> um, we moved things around on the, um, on the table that I'm using. Uh, we moved the document camera and so it's not perfectly adjusted. <laughs> Eventually, things will become easier, more refined. Either that or we'll change them again and I I'll just be off for another few days. We'll, we'll see. A sheet of bee, bee comb foundation must be inserted in every frame of the hive and super. This acts as a guide and causes the bees to build straight combs. It also encourages them to work and supplies them with wax that they would otherwise have to produce. They use about 15 pounds of honey to produce one pound of wax. Interesting. So this is, like I said, 1930. 1930, they had bee beekeeping supplies in the seed catalog. Interesting. I never thought of clover as something that you would farm, but I guess it makes sense. I also never realized that alfalfa was clover. Um, poultry feeds, sprayers and dusters, lots of farm implement stuff in here, which honestly is probably why we have these seed catalogs is the association with farming and farm implements and um, I mean we have uh, Virginia Tech was originally Virginia Agricultural and Mechanical College. Uh, there are still to this day very very good agricultural programs here. Um, so the seed catalogs make sense on that end. I guess I initially thought we had them because of our history of food and drink collection, but now I suspect that they may have more to do with the um, agriculture stuff. Dominion Seed House, 1935 Seed and Nursery Book. Dominion Seed House, Georgetown, Ontario. See, and I just don't know why I should be able to zoom all the way out and fit a full eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, but for some reason I can't. And I am uncertain why that is. Still, we have a, this is from 1935. The Garden of Your Dreams is in quotation marks. Seed and nursery book. Uh, very stereotypical back view of a man with his arm around a woman, a little girl running up with a dog at her heels, holding a bunch of flowers. And they're all looking out at an extensive garden. The Rose, Queen of Flowers. Blaze. At last, a hardy, ever-blooming scarlet climber. So valuable, so outstanding a variety in the new is the new Blaze considered that it, I, its introducers, Jackson and Perkins, Newark, New York, have obtained a patent upon it. U.S. Patent Number 10. Yeah, Philip, the cover does kind of seem like an illustration from a Dick and, Dick and Jane book. Yeah. 
it's a very like middle America idealism, um, Norman Rockwell, uh, sanitized view of the ideal American life from the mid 1930s. Mushroom culture. I love mushrooms, so that caught my eye. Uh, <laughs> uh, easy, easy method of growing mushrooms. A planter gives the following directions for growing mushrooms on the lawn. Break up the brick into about 20... Yeah, I didn't miss any words. Break up the brick into about 20 square pieces. At intervals of about two feet, lift a piece of sod placing under it a trowel full of fresh horse manure, on which place a piece of spawn and replace the sod. Do this in May so the warm rains will start the mushrooms. In a long dry, sp in a long dry spell, water daily. If these directions are followed, the size of the crop will be dependent on the weather. It is important that the spawn be planted previous to the early warm rains as mushrooms cannot be grown in this manner so successfully in midsummer. Repeat above method in August to obtain a big fall crop. Indoor growing. Any cellar, basement, or other building where a fairly even temperature may be maintained affords ideal conditions. In most house cellars, temperature is easily controlled. Full directions are sent with every order. Our spawn is produced by the exclusive owners of the French spore processes, or French spore process, which is the brand the most successful mushroom growers continue to use. Interesting. Shamrock lawn mixture. Beans. Asparagus, artichokes, kale, broccoli, or hardy cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, Chinese celery cabbage, interesting, interesting, interesting. Oh, there's another example of specifically bred foods. Um, most people in the United States think of carrots as orange, but carrots did not used to be orange at all. <laughs> they were specifically bred, uh, the orange carrots were specifically bred for William of Orange, um, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, and it was not previously a color that carrots naturally were. Amsterdam color coreless forcing. Especially desirable for greenhouse and frame culture, entirely coreless and of delicious flavor. Small short tops, roots, roots blunt pointed and fresh deep orange. Very popular wherever tried and we recommend this highly for the garden as well as the greenhouse. If anybody has a particular plant that they would be interested in knowing whether it appears in the catalogs, um, do ask and I will see if we can find uh, mention of that plant in any of these catalogs. They've got their order form. And they, um, they want you to send us good names. And we will send you prepaid one bulb of the new Purple Pier Gladiolus. See catalog, page 87. Do not pick names at random. We want only names of people who love their gardens and houseplants. 
far better to send names of five or ten people who take pride in their lawns and gardens than hundreds we could get in any telephone directory. If you will see that we get good names only and send them with your order, we will select a fine bulb of this new monster glad. Send names and addresses on plain paper. Give us the names of your neighbors so that we can market to them. Dominion Seed House. Let's see what the next one is. J.A. Everett, Seedsman, again with the red and green. Um, does this have a year? 1890. Wholesale prices. Natural representation of a tomato tree with front foliage removed to show the fruit. OK Seeds and Other Specialties, Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> OK Seeds, interesting. Every man and his pocketbook. Just see them seeds a growing. They're fine, I do declare. Okay seeds, that's the kind, and they're growing everywhere. The more okay seeds are planted, the more money is saved at the start, and the greater returns in the resulting crops. A plain talk to the people. For years, we have been selling our good OK seeds direct to the planter and number our customers by many thousands, representing probably every county in the country. Our ambition is to have our OK seeds planted on every farm and in every garden in the country. We hope to accomplish this because no other seeds are so cheap. No other seeds are so good. The new ever uh, the new evergreen bean introduced this year, eighteen ninety nine. It seldom falls to the lot of any seedsman to introduce such a distinct and meritorious variety of vegetables as we have in our new evergreen bean, a bean that is unsurpassed in its green state by any other variety in existence, or if allowed to ripen on the stalk, then pulled and cooked in the winter, pods and all, equals the best fresh green beans, is worthy the attention of all gardeners. This is what we have in our new evergreen variety. The evergreen bean has a long, round green pod entirely stringless medium size, pure white beans, that if not used in the pods are equal to the best white beans when dry and shelled. The beans, in the, the beans in the green state are most delicious and remain in prime condition a long time. In fact, they never get tough, even, even when left to mature on and dry on the stalk. They can be pulled and will cook into a tender, delicious dish of green beans. The illustration is intended to impress upon our readers the fact that they can now <coughs> enjoy a delicious dish of green beans as well on Christmas as on the 4th of July. 
In fact, this new bean makes it possible to have green beans every day of the year. Any garden without this new bean for $18.99 will be lacking of the chief novelty and chief attraction that it might possess. Enjoy green beans every day in the year. <coughs> Ag history and food history. Fruit catalog lithographed catalogs. Interesting. Yeah, I was pretty sure there were some blog posts about the seed catalogs, uh, or at least some sort of seed catalog. Um, for those of you who aren't in the VTUL Studios chat, uh, Kira was just mentioning that um, there are some lovely fruit catalog lithographed catalogs as well. And she's looking to see if she can find a blog post that um, about them that has some examples. So with this, we've got their order form. J.A. Everett Seedsman, Indianapolis, Indiana. And this one came with an envelope. Addressed to J.A. Everett Seedsman, Indiana Indianapolis, Indiana. And in 1899, apparently that's all you needed to put on the envelope. You didn't even need to put an address. Just Indianapolis, Indiana, and it was going to get there. Stop! Don't seal this until you have included a subscription. Subscription, 50 cents. A year with free seed distribution. And I didn't read the entire thing <coughs> because there's a giant gap in that sentence. <coughs> it is stop! Don't seal this until you have included a subscription to up-to-date farming and gardening, Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> Beets, the great secret. If you want the best seeds at the lowest cost, that, that will produce the best crops and realize the most money, plant Everett's celebrated OK seeds. <laughs> Potatoes. Somewhat creative in their uh, their discussion of okay seeds. There, there we go. Uh, blog posts. <coughs> Thank you, Kira. There's one here that I want to look at. So I'm going to skip some of what I've pulled because this one looked rather interesting. It's very colorful, but still just green and red. But I thought this one was attractive to the eye, which made me want to look at it. Um, this one is... Peter Henderson and Company, 35 and 37 Cortland Street, New York. Manual of Everything for the Garden. Henderson's seeds are genuine only when supplied by us direct to the consumer. And this is from 1898. Um, it is bound together with there are holes punched in here, and it's just tied. Yeah, I th this one caught my eye, which is, I mean, most of them are, most of them are inside little envelopes, so they don't have a chance to catch my eye. Um, this one wasn't, and and caught my eye, and I thought it was worth looking at.
I also don't want to be rough with it. Important announcement. Peter Henderson and Company's new departure. Henderson's seeds are genuine only when supplied by us, direct to the planter. One of our main reasons is that by only supplying the planter direct with, we remove the tendency to dangerously cheapen production, which successful competition for the dealer's trade continually demands. Best seeds cannot be the cheapest. Our aim to supply the post seeds. Oh, no. Some of the text has come off due to the embossing on the other side of the cover. Um, our aim to supply the best seeds in the world that all may learn that Henderson's superior seeds produce superior crops. Our mission, expert breeding, improving and growing of pedigree seeds carefully selected to ideal types and ever rising standards. Interesting. Henderson's seeds are delivered free, except where noted, anywhere in the United States, direct to the planter. <coughs> Important notice. While we do not offer to prepay transportation charges on peas, beans, and corn anywhere, Yet we will do so in the following states. Connecticut, Delaware, District of Columbia, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Vermont, Virginia, West Virginia, Wisconsin. Provided other vegetable or flower seeds to equal or greater value are ordered at the same time and provided also that the order amounts to $2 and upwards and accompanied by cash. Peter Henderson and Company, 35 and 37, Cortland Street, New York. Interesting policy. And then they've got their ordering sheet and a, a, an index. How long did that policy last? Is that what you're asking? Oh, how did, how did the book last? 123 years? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Most likely it was on a shelf. Um, it appears to have a piece of tape here at the top. Um, and that I can't tell if that tape was applied because there was cracking in the in the binding. I'm guessing that's why it was applied. What I find really interesting is this cover. You can see kind of the discoloration around the edges. Um, and that's because at some point this catalog was stacked. Um, at some point it was in a stack with something else sitting directly on top of it. And so just these edges got exposed to, to light over time. This is discoloration due to light, uh, where the center of the cover had like another book sitting on top of it and didn't get discolored. So really, like the reason why this lasted is that it was on somebody's shelf and there with a bunch of other books and that's how it managed to survive. Um, but I don't know. I don't know exactly where we got it from. But yeah, I can I can tell just from the discoloration on the cover that it was it was in a stack of books at some point in time and for a long enough time to have sun discoloration um, around the edges. Eighteen ninety eight looms up the dawn we hope of better times, and with it, our manual of 
everything for the garden. Larger and more interesting than ever. That it is larger, we know. That it is more interesting than usual, we believe, from the great variety of new features that have been injected into it. As to this, however, our patrons will be the best judges. We do not propose on this page to more than touch upon two or three of the more important features that characterize this edition, and before doing so, we deem it only proper to thank most heartily our customers for their very liberal patronage of last season. It being our Golden Jubilee anniversary, we were v naturally anxious that it should be the blue ribbon year of our 50 years business existence, and it was in the face of the general depressed condition of business prevailing in the spring of 1897. Uh, only 33 years after the Civil War. Yeah. And 33, 33 years after the Civil War and they You'll note their list of um, where they will prepay transportation charges. It's all northern and midwestern. Nothing in the south, really. Like, they, they get down to Virginia. But they don't even go down into North Carolina with this policy. Nope, nope, they do. They do North Carolina. They don't, Georgia's not on here. Um, South Carolina's not on here. So much of like the, the Confederacy is not actually represented in where they apply that policy. I wonder why that is. I mean, they're centered in New York. So it may have something to do with just the, the cost associated with shipping. Um, but they're willing to do it all the way out to Michigan. So who knows? My guess is that it's probably related to the cost of shipping, but it may also be related to their expectation that whoever is purchasing will be able to pay their debts. Garden vegetables. Brief directions for the sowing and culture of garden vegetables for the public garden and exhibition. And they cover, let's see, asparagus, beans, dwarf or bush, pole or lime, pole lima or climbing beans, beet, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, carrot, celery, sugar corn, cress or peppergrass, cucumber, eggplant, endive, kale or borkhole, leek, lettuce, uh, I feel like just because of Bonnie Gordon and her antics online in the last couple of weeks, uh, I need to read the entry for eggplant in at least one seed catalog. I know that some of the viewers who came over with 16-bit Eric's raid will likely know to what I am referring um, regarding Bonnie Gordon and eggplant. Uh, but if you're not familiar, Bonnie Gordon is um, an entertainer and a member of the Library Bards as well as the Streampunks RPG TTRPG group that streams over on Q Times. And during one of their sessions a couple weeks ago, she just randomly put a filter on her camera to make herself look like an eggplant, and it was hilarious. So in honor of her, I will read the eggplant entry. Uh, eggplant, one ounce for 1,000 plants. German, Eierpflanze, Eier French aubergine, Spanish uh, berengena. The eggplant will thrive well in any good garden soil, but will repay good treatment. 
The seed should be sown in hotbeds or warm greenhouse in March or April, and when about an inch high, pot in two inch pots. Plant out about June 1st, two and a half feet apart. If no hotbed is at hand, they can be grown in any light room where the temperature will average 75 degrees. For exhibition, the New York Improved Spineless is unsurpassed. Set the plants three to four feet apart and water with liquid manure, allowing not more than two fruits to, pl to each plant. We have muskmelon, watermelon, okra or gumbo, onion, parsley, parsnip, peas, pepper, pumpkin, radish, rhubarb, salsify, or oyster plant. I'm unfamiliar with this one, so let's read this one. German, Bochspart, French, salsifis, Spanish, ostra vegetal, one ounce to 75 feet of drill. The oyster plant succeeds best in light, well-entrenched, mellow soil, which previous to sowing the seeds should be stirred to a depth of 18 inches. So early in spring, in drills 18 inches apart, cover the seeds with fine soil an inch and a half in depth, and when the plants are strong enough, thin out to six inches apart. So this, I, I'm uncertain. I don't think this is actually a seed catalog. I except that it had an order form, so maybe it is. But this part at the beginning is most definitely telling you how to grow these things, like giving you instruction on what to do with the seeds when you get them. It doesn't actually list a price, um, which is interesting. Spinach, squash, tomato, turnip, cold frames and hotbeds, preparation of manure, early spring cabbage. New lettuce number two, golden, golden rose celery. Woo! We have color illustrations. Peter Henderson and Company, New York, 1898. Red rocket radish, white tipped rocket radish. Henderson's Metropolitan Sweet Corn. Down at the bottom, we have White Rocket Radish. And New Early Tomato Freedom. New Early Pea Prosperity, introduced last season as 1897. The earliest wrinkled pea grown, Henderson's Prosperity. Introduced by us last season as 1897 and for which we offered $200 for a name. For such is now the name of 1897, see colored plate on opposite page. You may now have large, tender peas, sweet and delicious, in early June, or as soon as you have heretofore had the ordinary early kinds. Enormous peas, enormous pods, enormous yielder. We have received 2,896 letters of praise for the 1897 or Prosperity Pea. This season, many of them were warmly enthusiastic over its merits. Space only permits us to print the following. Hyde Park, New York. I picked 1897 pea on the 18th of June. It is far superior to any pea I have ever grown. There, there are eight and nine large, fine large peas to a pod. It certainly is very a very fine pea. James Horrocks, manager, Crumb World Farms. Springfield, Massachusetts. While inspecting several of the finest estates at Lenox, Massachusetts, I was much impressed with what I saw of your new early pea, 1897. Would you kindly favor me with a small packet of seed? If they do with me as they did at Lenox, would like to illustrate them 
in Farm and Home, F.H. Plum, Agricultural Editor. Rhinecliff, New York. I consider the 1897 a first-class pea. Eight to ten large peas to a pod. Uniform in ripening, very tender, good flavor, good, co good cropper. T. Harrison, gardener to Honorable Levi P. Morton. Your new pea, 1897. I consider the best pea I have ever grown in the past 25 years. I have picked three and a half bushels out of one quart of seed. M.J. Connors, Irvington on Hudson, New York. The 1897 pea combines extreme earliness, quantity, and quality. The plant is robust and vigorous, and the peas rich in flavor. Elma M. Brown, Buffalo, New York. Mass Horticultural Society awarded George D. Moore of Arlington, Massachusetts first prize for Henderson's 1897 pea over all other peas. And Mr. Moore writes us, your early 1897 pea took first prize and tops anything I have ever exhibited at the Mass Horticultural Society and the society is open to all the world. I have given four quarts to several of our vegetable commissioners and they have, uh, and they all agree that so far it leads anything yet offered. <laughs> this is a lot of text about this new variety of pea that they decided to offer in 1897. We have never yet been able to offer to our patrons an early pea which possesses in a marked degree more desirable qualities. On both sides of the Atlantic, specialists in pea culture, hang on, telling Windows not to restart again. <coughs> on both sides of the Atlantic, specialists in pea culture have been struggling with the problem how to combine fine quality and productiveness with earliness. It must be conceded that hitherto all these efforts have failed. Inasmuch as we have only been able to offer for very early use the round and hard shell types of extra early peas, these have a value, a value peculiarly their own, but the quality is far below what we would wish. We feel confident that at last a variety has been secured which combines earliness with all the good features of the latter marrow varieties, viz. delicious flavor, tenderness, sweetness, size, and productiveness. This variety has had very thorough and exhaustive trials conducted in various latitudes and under varied conditions. Therefore, we have no hesitancy in making the most extravagant claims for its merits, which are supported by the opinions of expert gardeners. Prosperity P grows about two and a half feet in height. The vine is robust and the foliage is large and vigorous, closely resembling telephone in general appearance, though dwarfer and very much earlier. The pods, which are as large as telephone, are produced in great abundance and are well filled with from six to eight peas of enormous size. But as we have stated, its chief value lies in its earliness. And when we consider the pea so large and as rich in flavor as any of the latter wrinkled sorts, can be had three days after Henderson's first of all of the best and earliest round or hard shell variety, its value can be readily seen. Among those who grow peas for their own use exclusively, there are many who plant only the extra early types because our short spring and hot summers are not conducive to the free growth of the latter varieties. It is to this class of growers that we recommend this variety with confidence. They can now obtain early in the season while climatic conditions are favorable, as delicious peas as is possible under any conditions in this country or any other. 20 cents for half a pint, 35 cents for a pint, 60 cents for a quart, and $4 for a pack. <laughs> and that's not even all the words. There's a whole sec second column on the right-hand side of the page with more about Praising that P. P. 
ponderosa tomato. Some grasses and clovers again. Flowers and novelties. Ooh! Henderson's Giant Marguerite Carnations. I love the color illustrations that pop up in these books from the 1890s. Henderson's Acme Collection of Sweet Peas. Price for a full collection of 22 varieties, $1. I am so curious about why it is named Acme. I mean, 1890 would have been before Acme was showing up in cartoons. So what, what did Acme mean back then in 1898? <coughs> The Acme collection of sweet peas we herewith offer, we, we consider the best ever sent out for variety, distinctiveness, and individual superiority. It is composed mostly of the latest introductions, though there are in the collection a few of the older varieties of such, such distinctiveness and beauty that they are indistinguishable in every collection. They are all beautiful in their modest loveliness, perfection in form, graceful in arrangement, delightful in perfume, exquisite in coloring, lavish in bloom, unequaled for cutting, <coughs> gay and cheery in the garden, of the easiest culture succeeding with everybody, in short, irresistible in their wealth of charms. If the primitive varieties were such fragrant favorites in the old-fashioned garden, it is to be wondered at with these wonderfully improved sorts of increased size, better shape, greater quality of bloom, with three and four flowers born on a stem and with lovely new colors that sweet peas are now enjoyed, are now enjoying unprecedented popularity. <coughs> but they don't talk about where the name comes from. Why are they called Acme? Uh, image result. For Acme origin, Acme comes from the Greek meaning peak, zenith, or prime. Interesting. I did not know that, and that would that would make sense why they would use it to describe their sweet peas. I had no idea that that was the meaning of Acme. And that justifies today's entire stream. I have learned something. <laughs> and hopefully you have too. <laughs> I do hope that these are educational or interesting uh, when I do them. And I don't always know. But today we learned about the where the term acme came from and what it means. Henderson's Select Quartet of Hardy Garden Roses. Henderson's superb collection, Double Fringed Petunias. And Kira is on it because I didn't even see whatever that was. So thank you, Kira. We probably have time for one or two more. Ooh, fruit trees. We haven't looked at very much with fruit trees. And this one seems really small. It's 
start with the small one and then we'll do the fruit trees. Really, really, oh wow. <laughs> okay. So this is E.P. Reeve and Company catalog, 1898. Um, this seems to maybe be just a supplement to the catalog. <coughs> no, it's just a really, really, really small single sheet of paper catalog. E.P. Reeve and Company's catalog of fresh and reliable garden seeds for the season of 1898. Richmond, Virginia, February 1st, 1898. At the opening of a new season, we take occasion to cordially thank our friends and patrons in this branch of our business for their liberal support in the past 10 years. The steady increase during this period attests, to the <coughs> attests the general satisfaction given, and we can only promise in the future to continue, as in the past, to use our best efforts to give our patrons the best seeds the country affords at rates as reasonable as possible. Having burned all remnants, the least doubtful, our present stock is entirely fresh and reliable, larger and more varied than ever before, grown by David Landreth and Sons, of whose seeds we have the exclusive sale in Richmond and vicinity. We respectfully ask all in need of first-class seeds to give us a call, feeling confident of our ability to give satisfaction both in price and quality of goods. Very respectfully, E.P. Reeve and Company, Druggists and Seedsmen. Orders by mail filled promptly. Postage, eight cents per pound extra. And then inside, we have their catalog. They offer peas in multiple varieties, first and best, American Wonder. Uh, Danny O'Rourke Improved, McLean's Little Gem, Tom Thumb, Large White Marrow Fat, Black Eye, Marrow Fat, and other varieties. They offer bush beans, <coughs> Extra Early Red Speckled Valentine, Early Red Speckled Valentine, uh, I'm uncertain what the quotes here are telling me to repeat. I'm, it appears extra mohawk or brown would be the repetition, but I'm unsure, uncertain. Yellow, dwarf black wax, golden wax. I wonder if Bush's beans is called that because of Bush beans. Like they're, they're the beans that they make are what used to be referred to as bush beans. I wonder if that is where their name comes from. Pole beans, they have large lima, uh, burpees large dwarf lima beans, and small dwarf lima beans. Uh, corn, beets, cabbages, carrots, celery, cucumber, eggplant, kale, kohlrabi, uh, leek, lettuce, watermelon, muskmelon, parsnip, pepper, radish, salsify, spinach, squash, tomato, and turnip. And I almost broke into Sondheim there. <coughs> Parsley, peppers, cabbage, and celery. Um, but then on the back, <coughs> in addition to our large stock of garden seeds, we have always on hand a large and carefully selected stock of fresh and pure drugs. Medicines and chemicals, select toilet articles, paints, oils, dye, dye stuffs, window glass and putty, cigars and tobacco, and all articles usually kept in a first-class drugstore. Prompt and careful attention to all orders. Registered pharmacist in attendance at all hours who will fill prescriptions with accuracy and dispatch. Our special preparations. Pollux Remedy for Dyspepsia. <coughs> Duval and Norton's Celebrated Horse Tonic, Reeves Rheumatic Cure, Reeves Cough Cure, Reeves Emulsion of Pure Norwegian Cod Liver Oil and Hypophosphites, Reeves Alternative or Blood Syrup, Reeves Thymol Tooth Powder, Reeves Thymol Mouthwash, and Dr. McClellan's Toothache Drops. More than 40 years' experience enables us to offer the public this line of preparations of unsurpassed merit, 
the result of a trial will prove their best recommendation. Oh, Hannah, um, thank you for stopping by. I hope that everything goes well picking up your mom and that you are safe and arrive safely home. I will see you next time. When I first pulled this catalog out, this sh small single page catalog, the first thing I saw was fresh and pure drugs. <laughs> and um, it was not what I was expecting. <laughs> but it caught my eye and made me read it. All right, we're getting close to the end. I've got one here about, uh, a, that is a descriptive, gotta treat that as Pepsi, yeah. A descriptive catalog of southern and acclimated fruit trees. Evergreens, roses, grapevines, cultivated and for sale at the Pomeria Nurseries by William Sum Summer Pomeria SC. Oh, by William Summer, Pomeria, South Carolina. Columbia, South Carolina, Calvo and Patton, State Printers, 18... 78. General index. Apple trees, pear trees, peach trees, cherries, plums, apricots, nectarines, figs, quinces, mulberries, nuts, medlars, pomegranates, native grapevines, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, esculent roots, hedge plants, ornamental department, ornamental department, Deciduous shrubs, vines and creepers, evergreen trees, evergreen shrubs, roses, bourbon roses, noisette roses, and bedding plants. Side note, gelatin companies also made some strange claims about des desserts and dyspepsia, too. Well, there's always room for jello. Or so we were told as kids. <coughs> so, I don't know. I honestly have no idea whether gelatin has anything to do with treating dyspepsia, but I do know that many of us grew up with our mothers giving us jello when we had upset stomachs. So, something with that stuck culturally for, for <laughs> the much lighter dessert alternative that wouldn't upset your stomach, yeah. To my patrons, the business of the Pomeria Nurseries has increased since its establishment regularly each year in a most satisfactory manner, and the proprietor returns his warmest acknowledgments to his liberal customers for their patronage. In preparing my new descriptive catalog, great care has been observed to make it as complete as the space devoted would allow. I have given first a descriptive list of fruits of every variety as they have been tested and found adapted to our climate. These descriptions have been carefully revised and corrected. Then follows a brief list of other varieties which have been tested here, but not so generally disseminated, which will aid the purchaser in his selections. In the ornamental department, the same care has been observed and brief descriptions also given. It has been a constant desire to have in cultivation all the best varieties of fruit as well as orn ornamental evergreens, trees, shrubs, and roses, which are suited to our climate and to supply these of a thrifty growth and condition to my patrons. As I am to the manner born, the proprietor trusts that persons about to plant will well give encouragement to their own nursery at home before sending their patronage abroad. All orders should be regularly and legibly written out in a list and not mixed up in the body of the letter. It avoids confusion and prevents mistakes. All trees and plants are carefully taken up, labeled, and packed in the best manner for which a moderate charge is made. Explicit directions for marking should accompany the order where the mode of conveyance is left for us to choose. We shall exercise our own judgment, but in all cases, articles are at the risk of the purchaser after being shipped. Should loss or delay occur, the forwarders alone must be held responsible. The Pomeria Nursery is situated one and a half miles south of Pomeria Depot 
on the Greenville and Columbia Railroad, and upon being previously advised by letter, I will always have a carriage awaiting the arrival of any visitors, and will entertain them in a rural style at my house during their stay. My stock of fruit trees was never so thriftly and well grown, and I trust all will be planted. My terms will be cash or good references. Yes, unlike a heavy cake. I think that is where we're going to end with that uh, message to patrons, um, instructions for how to go about placing an order and what terms would be accepted. Um, <coughs> so the semester here at Virginia Tech has ended, but we are continuing with our weekly broadcast of archival adventures. Next week, I'm pretty sure I'm going to pull out that bark book or I don't think it's really bark. It's like cores. It's little little square panels of tree cores. And it was really cool. And I think I'm going to pull that. We will take a gander at that. And I will also have on hand the Master Gardener uh, collection materials in case we decide we want to look at them as well. Um, and then for June, we'll pick another topic and kind of explore. Um, I find uh, some of the the gardening and plant life um, items really interesting. Um, if you're at all interested in food history, we definitely have a number of resources on the library's website. Um, uh, you're welcome to reach out to Special Collections for questions about food history. Uh, we have a number of resources. Um, so Special Collections can be reached at uh, specref at vt.edu, S-P-E-C-R-E-F, at vt.edu. Um, and we do, like I said, have an extensive food history collection. Um, in addition, uh, I will recommend two programs that I quite enjoy and learn a lot from. They're completely unaffiliated with Virginia Tech, but I do recommend them if you're at all interested in an entertaining approach to exploring old recipes. Um, I would recommend Emmy Made in Japan. Uh, her channel is on YouTube, and she um, has at least one series on there where she explores Depression-era recipes. Uh, so that's E-M-M-Y-M-A-D-E-I-N-J-A-P-A-N uh, on YouTube, um, Emmy Made in Japan. The other one is a series called Tasting History in, uh, that is also available on YouTube. Um, and he, I, in fact, don't even remember his name at the moment, but um, the, if you search for the series Tasting History, um, he explores kind of the history of some recipes and actually puts them into use and uh, tries to recreate the dishes. It's quite entertaining um, and quite educational at the same time. So if you are interested in uh, materials related to the history of food, we have plenty of resources for you here, but I would recommend either of those two YouTube uh, series um, where you can actually see some people try out old recipes, uh, which I think is quite fun. Um, that is going to be the end of the stream for today. I am going to throw us over in a raid to um, Monterey Bay Aquarium because they should be live. Yep, they are. Um, I believe it is the jellyfish cam, so just a heads up in case anybody is uh, not fond of jellyfish and doesn't want to see them. Um, we will head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium from both channels. Uh, thank you all for joining me today on Archival Adventures, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Bye! <laughs>